Thank you very much. Uh, I've been asked to give a few words about myself, first of all, and I did warn Willie that when I do that, well, anything could happen. Um, my story starts in the headmaster's office at Primack County Secondary Modern School in Cone in Lancashire. And I was standing in front of my headmaster and he was saying, why haven't you been in assemblies? I said, I don't believe in God, sir. I was an atheist. It looked as though I was going to get expelled. But the deputy headmaster was there as well, and I think he shared my views at the time. And in God's providence, I was allowed to stay on to finish my exams. I walked around for two or three weeks looking for a job after leaving school through Burnley, Nelson and Cone, and couldn't find one. So my dad got me a, a job in Crestfelts in, in Cone, the most monotonous, deadly job I've ever had. So I joined the Royal Air Force for five years. At RAF Stafford, there was a man called Bernard Wheatman. He was a, a part-time scripture reader. And he was walking down the corridor one day, and I just happened to be walking behind him, and the light was absolutely terrible. So I, I looked, and I thought it was an officer or a warrant officer because he had epaulets up here on his raincoat. We didn't have. As I got nearer, I realized he was neither. He was a Sazra scripture reader. Bernard asked if he could speak to me. I never know to this day why I said yes. I think it must have been God at work. And he talked about John 3, verse 5 and verse 16. And I was, I was challenged by it all. But I didn't want it. I didn't want it at all. I wanted to go to the Nafi to have my pie and my pint. And I just wanted rid of him. And then a friend came in. And he came into the room and said, hello, Bernard. Obviously surprised to see him there. And I thought, these two know each other. So I thought, I know what he's been, my friend's been to uh, church. So I'll turn these two against each other. And then I can go and have my pie and my pint. Didn't work. I said, this guy says you've got to be born again. What do you think? Quite right. I was born again a fortnight ago. The ground could have swallowed me up. I still wanted rid of them after they were witnessing to me. So they finally must have given up on me and said, uh, we'll just pray before we go. And they knelt. So I thought, oh, right, anything to get rid of you. I knelt. But while they were praying, I was seeing the faces of lads at school that I had tried to influence with atheism. And it was as if God was saying to me, Paul, you are a sinner. You do need a savior. This is your opportunity. I hadn't got the jargon. I hadn't been to church since I was 14. Didn't know anything really about religion. But I asked Christ to, to forgive me. It was as simple as that. Now, one thing I want to say is if any of you are involved in evangelistic work of any kind, you don't know the end game. Bernard never knew what I went on to be. He died within 18 months of my conversion. And I was in Sharjah at the time in the Persian Gulf. I left the RAF. I had six years of study, two years at Bible Training Institute in Glasgow, and four at Margaret Macmillan Memorial College of Education in Bradford. And here's the ironic part. Do you think God's got a sense of humor? I know he has. I became an RE teacher and had to organize assemblies. 
After two years at Pudsey Grammar School, I became an SIM affiliate missionary, a lecturer and a preacher in Nigeria. Some of the happiest years of my life in many ways. I had been a Sunday school teacher. I had worked in the open air at Morecambe and other places. I had been a deacon in the church at Pudsey. The Lord had other plans for me. And you'll find out a little bit about that later as well. When we came back, I became, amongst other things, a Sousra local representative in Leeds. I'm a member of the same church as Glynn. And I also became a member of the uh, Leeds City Missions Management Committee. And I'm now the chairman. For my sins, I suspect. I do itinerant preaching, helping small churches everywhere that I can. And up to COVID coming along, I had 51 bookings in one year. I continue to be a visiting lecturer and preacher at Kagoro in the Equa Seminary in Northern Nigeria, teaching about homiletics and also Sunday school teaching courses when asked to do so. So that's a, a rough picture of who I am and what I do. Let's turn to Psalm 46. I'm reading from the New King James Version. <coughs> God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Selah. Pause and calmly think about that. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Verse 10 is a, a very precious verse to me. My first wife and I arranged a beautiful painting with this verse on it to give to her father on behalf of the church for his faithful pastoring of the church and individual pastoring of each one of us. He'd been unwell for some time. The next morning, he suddenly passed away. We had only just been in time to show our appreciation of him. Twice we are told in this psalm, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge in verse 7 and 11. Dear friends, I want to ask you this. Are you convinced of this today, even now? Do we believe that God is in the midst of us? Do we really believe that where two or three are gathered together 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will keep his promise to be in our midst. Underneath for the everlasting arms. And the enemy of our souls cannot withstand him to whom to know his life eternal and who we trust for perfect peace. The command today in the word of God to both believer and unbeliever alike is to be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, the heathen, the pagan, the Gentiles, us. I will be exalted in the earth. The greatest need in a busy age like the one we're living in is to really know God. To experience the power and the presence of God in our lives. During one of the hardest periods of my life, this verse became very precious to me in its entirety. To know God. The world laughs at this idea. It's ridiculous, they say. You're a religious maniac to believe such a thing. How can any man know God? Is there even a God to know? And scripture answers, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And throughout all its contents, it stresses the knowability of God. To know God is man's greatest end. It's the purpose for which he was created. Do you know God? No, I didn't ask you what you know about God. You can have an absolutely sound knowledge of the doctrine of God and still not know him. So the question is, do you know God? How sad it is to see that so many people today do not know God. They have absolutely no desire, no desire whatsoever for such knowledge as this psalm speaks of. It's so sad to see that so many people within the church Yes, even the evangelical churches and denominational churches with evangelical traditions have only an intellectual knowledge about God rather than an experiential knowledge, an experimental knowledge, if you like, of God. Both are necessary. Both are vital. The greatest need today is to be still and to know that I am God, declares the Lord of glory. Doing 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 and then one day suddenly it says doesn't it that god seems to be far away he's not as near as he used to be in our lives where is the joy that i once knew says the the hymn writer well i, I wonder friends if we've become like that have we come to know the god god the son as our savior but now we find ourselves out in the cold spiritually We've been so busy, haven't we, doing other things, even worshipping the box in the corner of the room, rather than getting to know God better and to do his will more. Throughout the coming days, we need to take the instruction of this verse seriously to our hearts. We need to be still and to know and to learn afresh that he is God. King David knew this from his own life, how easy it is to to fall away from the Lord, not eternally, but for a time. He knew he had broken some significant commandments of God, murder and adultery. He knew he had broken some very significant commandments, so he reminded his own son, Solomon, of the great need to know God. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. He says in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9. So it is that in Psalm 46, we find the guidance we need us to know how to go about learning to know our God as a living reality. And the first thing is, we have to be still. There comes a time for stillness. We can be so busy. There's always plenty for us to turn our hand to, providing, of course, it's not the Lord's work. We need to gather our straying thoughts in. We, we need to silence all our passions and our upsets and wait upon him. That we might know him and his will. 
Let me ask you a simple question. Are you regularly meeting with your Lord every day? If you're the head of a family, do you lead your family in worship daily? Being still doesn't mean that we turn into blocks of stone. It doesn't mean total inactivity. That's not the meaning. That's not what the word of God means. This stillness is the reverence of an adoring heart before an awesome God. We need to learn again that sense of the holiness of God, like Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6. We need to feel where, what he felt like, a sinner in the presence of real holiness. That will lead to a real stillness in God's presence. We need to meditate on the word of God. Do we really think about the passage that we're reading or the, a verse that we're reading? I don't know what your practice is, but three years ago, I bought one of these A4 diaries and I started recording in it daily what I felt the Lord was teaching me. I found that very helpful. Started off with just every verse, reading the whole chapter or whatever it was, and then um, went on to look at a, a particular verse in the second year and this year, I, I'm looking at the Psalms in particular, whilst reading through the Word of God every every year. <clears throat> when we do meditate, we ask ourselves, what does this tell me about God? Dear friends, when you do that, the wonder of your own salvation will shake you to the core of your very being. His love, his mercy, God, the wonder of God himself, his justice, his holiness, his attributes. They become more than mere intellectualism to you. You will begin to know God and then you and I will go out and preach and teach and will be stirred up into action. We do know much about God, but sadly, it seems that we need to know, know him personally more than we know, know him now. It was Spurgeon who wrote that we should beware of the head knowledge type of pride. And it was John Bunyan who wrote, there is knowledge and knowledge. Knowledge that rests in the bare speculation of things. And knowledge that is accompanied with the grace of faith and love which put a man upon doing even the will of God from the heart. Let's make it our business to know God. Be still and know that I am God. Leads us to something that we as people desperately need both now and in the future. A complete and utter confidence in our God. Even today as we pray for revival. We will study with care his nature, his word, his will. Then as people who know their God, we'll go out and do exploits for him. Our forebodings, our fears will vanish if we truly know our God when we remember the things that he's done in the past and that he has not changed. We will know that no matter what happens, God will take care of his people. And we will rest in that assurance, even if all the forces of hell should be lined up against us. And they will be. As we've been told and reminded today about this preacher in London who has been arrested. When we're under attack, we're often the most blessed because of our trust in the God we worship. The Apostle Paul wrote, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8, verse 18. Whenever God sets up a work using people who truly know him, then there will be opposition. We see it in our society today, and we see it in just about every part of the world. There will be suffering, and the believing church will be hammered by suffering for Jesus. But that's for our good. 
Now, the illustration I'm going to give you is quite dated in some ways, and I apologize for that. The prices are certainly wrong for a start. If you have a bar of iron with one pound sterling, and you hammer it into horseshoes, it becomes worth two pounds. It becomes 70 pounds when it's made into needles. It becomes 670 pounds when it's made into pen knife blades. And 50,000 pounds when it's made into watch springs. The more it is hammered, the more it is passed through the fire, beaten, pounded and polished, the more valuable it becomes. And the same is true if you are a Christian. As you and I know, learn to know God better, we will desire to live for him. And that means we will have to suffer for him. But remember, underneath are the everlasting arms. Oh, that we might know that he is our God. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let us pray.